everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Francis. I'm a contributing editor at uh, GamaSutra.com. I'm a, con a uh, community manager for GDC. I am also today... Oh, no. I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> deep I am trouble. Deep trouble. Um, uh, I am playing The Church in the Darkness. This is a game that comes from uh, Paranoid Productions, which is Richard Rouse 3's... Uh, Richard Rouse 3. Richard Rouse the Third's uh, game studio. You don't have to say the third out loud. That's I don't have to say the third say. out loud. Well. Yeah, just just written. Just written. Uh, Richard Rouse is uh, also the person who is in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Um, he is a veteran game designer who we have seen a lot on the GDC show floor. Um, uh, we are here today. Uh, Church in the Darkness finally came out. We streamed to this when we were when we were doing this on the Gamma Sutra Twitch channel a while back. We were we streamed to this with him then. Um, uh, you might have read about the game. You might have seen some stuff about the game. And now we're here to play the game and talk about its development. Richard, how are you doing? And how are the other two Richard Rouses? All right. <laughs> the other two Richard Rouses are not with us anymore, oh, as sorry. it happens. I, I, but <laughs> what was it? It's been a while, so it's 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 okay to say that, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, no, we're still. You know, we just shipped something like three weeks ago. Feels like they're looking at the calendar. Maybe it's four weeks ago. Not mm -hmm. quite four weeks, uh, and we're still working on patches. Stuff like that. Also, getting ready for a panel at PAX that we're doing with the voice actors. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's some... Uh, I don't know if you'll... Uh, folks, let me know if you can hear or not hear the voice actors in question. Um, uh, John Patrick Lowry and Ellen McLean uh, have lent their voices for this game. Uh, who you may know with them better as the sniper from Team Fortress 2 and uh, GLaDOS from Portal. Yes, and they're lovely people at, uh, at trade shows because... You know, if you're, if you're ever putting together a panel, you know, this mm -hmm. being the GDC channel, we can talk about this. Yeah. You know, when you're putting together a group of speakers, you know, you want to get people with good content, but also people who are, you know, charismatic and talk on stage, that sort yeah. of thing. And the great thing about actors is that's what they do. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so there's no, they will outclass the most famous developer given the chance. Right so. on. Um, Richard, uh, I could introduce your game for you, but why don't you do it? Uh, what is The Church in the Darkness and why did you make it? Yeah, so as we can see from uh, from Bryant here, desperately trying not to be detected. It's a bit of an infiltration game uh, with a top-down perspective, uh, inspired by some games I loved, you know, before I was in the industry. And it's set inside a religious cult in the 1970s, which you are infiltrating to look for your nephew, Alex. Mm -hmm. And it does a lot of sort of dynamic story stuff. So there's a ton of different endings you can get. We can talk more about those later because mm -hmm. uh, I could clarify some of the intention there, which is a little bit different than how I've seen people taking it now that the game's out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a ton of different endings you can get based on choices you make. But we also change up the personalities of the preachers each time. So you're making choices based on different personalities to the cult leaders. And that sort of makes it a procedural story ish mm -hmm. sort of thing um it is also it's got roguelike qualities i believe you said you've been playing for a while and have been captured twice already so if you get oh, if you get shot again oh yeah you're running into the hornet's nest here but you're also you know been playing this long enough that you know that if you if you keep moving you can get out of many scrapes not all but many um i can't tell if the uh alarm is going off right now i would imagine it would be I believe it was. I think it yeah. got clear. Yeah, cool. So now I'm just going to um, find uh, Charles. Uh, not Charles Xavier, but just Charles. Yeah, anyway, you were saying. <laughs> not Charles Xavier. That would be a different game. Um, but yeah, so it's it's you're infiltrating this group, trying to find your nephew. You know, if you play your cards right, you may want to go confront the cult leaders. Um, there are scenarios where you may agree with what the cult leaders are doing uh, and not think they're so bad after all. Because uh, often... You know, when we hear about cults, we hear about, you know, the, the worst of them. And groups that still would be described as a cult might, you know, not be dangerous. You know, they might just really be earnest about whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. I've often joked that software companies are often like cults, particularly small ones, or particularly ones that have a really strong leader at the center. Mm -hmm. You know, that when that person shows up in the room, everyone quiets down and does what they say. And that's kind of like, you know, what we would call a cult to be. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting sort of, uh, obviously this is not a software company, you know, uh, it's, it's a very different situation in a lot of ways, but whenever people would say, have you had any experience with cults, I say, well, not exactly, but yes, sort of. So, 
Yeah, right on. Um, what, um, uh, we talked about this, so you and I have had a couple conversations about this game. Um, the first thing that we can loop back to is, um, I think what's striking about designing a systemic game around, uh, cults and cult compounds is, um, there's a direct inspiration of real life behavior, real life instances. Uh, it's quickly comparable to Jonestown, um, uh, uh, and the tragedy that went down there in South America. Um, what was sort of your first, um, instinct for systemizing, uh, the, the sort of the, the cult of like the, the central personality, the paranoia, the backstabbing, like what was sort of your first instinct for taking that and making it playable? Yeah. The, the thing that, I mean, there's two things. Like I liked the idea of a game that would, have a narrative that was inherently different every time that wasn't mm -hmm. just your choices making it different but also just the story had different elements that you would have to figure out sort of like a murder like a game i often compare it to clue the board game you know where who did the murders different every time and that's why you can play it more than once mm -hmm. um uh, and so i just like the idea of exploring that i don't think the game is as replayable as clue but it's you know it's got some of those elements to it mm -hmm. um uh, so so I've been fascinated by that and then looking at cults you know I've been fascinated by cults as a really interesting game topic because it's a scary dangerous place like that note you just saw has some mm -hmm. overtones of of danger to it you know that they're down in the you know how long was Chuck in the cage and that sort of thing um, it's an interesting place to, to, to set a game because I think people like to go to sort of taboo locations and explore them in, in the safe environment of a game. Um, but also because as I, would, as I was sort of looking more at cults, it was interesting to me that they often start out with very altruistic intentions. Mm -hmm. Like they're trying to improve society by building their own society or they're trying to um, make something more equal or they're, they're, they're worried society is terrible in some way and they're going to finally... Um, you know, build the right version of society, or you know, their people might have drug problems, or they might have other. A lot of a lot of cults promise sort of self improvement things. Um, so it was interesting to me that these groups that we think of as so bad can start out, you know, in a really positive way, or at least so everybody thinks. And then by the time it has drifted into darker territory, people are too trapped to to realize it even, let alone to leave. Um, and so I just thought that was an interesting thing to explore, and then that dovetailed with the how do you know if a cult is bad or not? Because a lot of cult groups in the world won't end in a tragedy. They'll just end in their people doing stuff until they run out of money, and then they'll go home or something like that. Or they'll survive for decades, which happens as well. And mm -hmm. Certain communes in the U.S. are still going decades later. Um, so I just thought it was interesting to like put you as a player into it, let you realize, like, here you're talking to Charles, you know, mm -hmm. why did he join the group? He has some pretty good reasons for wanting to join the group, pretty good reasons for not liking the U.S., or at least that's the intention that people could, whether they agree with him, they can at least sympathize with why he's there, and then make you think, you know, I like, I definitely like, in all my media, sort of challenging expectations of, of what you expect to happen isn't necessarily what happens. So often people think, oh, cult, they're going to be so crazy. And then you get in, it's like, no, they're just people trying to do something different. And mm -hmm. maybe it's going wrong, and maybe it's not going wrong. And you get to, to try to decide, you know, is it is it uh, as bad as, as everyone in the inside world says it is? Right down. Um, uh, Al, Charles is talking about the walkers. That is the two cult leaders who show up in every uh, run of the game that you make. Um, the walkers have kind of a top-down personality that informs your run, which is um, uh, that depending on what their moods are, and this one I can clearly specify because I've been died a couple times and seen, it seems like um, the, the husband walker is uh, pretty intent on getting apocalyptic with this, um, and uh, um, uh, but, his, but his wife... Uh, I'm forgetting their first names, I'm sorry. She's, Isaac and Rebecca. She's, yeah. ma she's made clear that... Um, uh, She's a little nervous about this, and she doesn't want this to go down. Um, could you break down from the top level, like where, how the the procedural design of this sort of works, um, and how like their transitions every time change what the player experiences? Yeah, so um, you've you've laid it out pretty well so far, and I will say before going into that that it's always interesting when people are playing where they're like, I think this is happening because I saw this, you know, I think I'm dealing with this version and, and they're, they're wrong as often as they're right, particularly if they're just starting to play it. So mm -hmm. I feel good that it's like, 
slightly complex enough that people are not always guessing exactly what version they're dealing with each time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, basically the, the cult leaders, um, you know, the thing we change up is not their dogma. So some people sort of expect, you know, when I say, Oh, the story is different. They expect like, well, this time it's a UFO cult and this time it's, uh, you know, some, some other wildly different thing. It's like, well, no, they're basically always the same Christians with a socialist message. Um, thing that that's sort of inspired by some some family members who who believe that sort of thing um and of it's, mine uh, it's close to people's temple right i mean so the the uh you know obviously people's temple was an inspiration but sort of one of many and the the cult leaders are are pretty different than than jim yeah. jones you know yeah. by the time jim jones was in the jungle, he was, you know, he was no longer a Christian, really. He was yeah. calling himself God and said the Bible was used to keep people down and stuff, which is, you know, that's, <laughs> I'm not going to say whether, you know, I agree with that statement or not, but uh, the, the walkers here, the, the cult leaders here, well, first of all, there's a man and a woman doing it, not just a, just one guy, but mm -hmm. um, they, they're they very much still Christians um, and sort of interpreting the Bible, how they, you know, how they see it leads to them building this compound in the jungle. Yeah. Um, uh, but like the architecture and stuff like that is probably yeah. the closest to what you would expect out of a, a Jonestown. Yeah, to get us back on topic, uh, the architecture of uh, the the design was something I was asking about before. If you're able to... Right. Sorry, I'll get us back on track. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so uh, basically the cult leaders have a lot of the same dogma each time, but it's just how dangerous they are mm -hmm. that we change up. Um, and it's not just they're both dangerous or both not. There's some differences beyond that. Uh, so it's not just like two states. It's more states than two. I don't want to say exactly how many states it are, there are, but some people figured it out. Um, but there's that those states plus some extra sort of red herrings, I call them, that we sprinkle in that change up their personality but maybe don't change how dangerous they are as people. And I thought that was interesting – because, you know, if you look at something like a Jonestown, um, you know, a lot of what he said early on was something you could, a lot of people could believe in and, and seemed sincere and seemed like it was addressing real problems in the world. And it's just he went too far with it. But imagine another group where he didn't go to these, these too far uh, reaches with it and, and, and really brought the group in the, the tra leading to the tragedy that, that eventually uh, that eventually happened um, but you could imagine someone having the same dogma and not ending in tragedy and that's sort of what we're doing here right on uh, um, so how do from the top down how does that change like how does the game sort of play out uh, how, behind the scenes like without giving away everything that would spoil right play, right what's the what's the design uh, pins holding up this whole thing together yeah so basically once we decided you know, from from a collection of personality states that the game can start with for the cult leaders, then that impacts the game in a ton of different ways. Mm -hmm. So there's the voiceover that you're hearing over the PA system. Um, he won't talk to you until you get the alarm reset, by the way. Oh. Um, that's, once if you've got the perma alarm going on because you've murdered too many people, you have to go have reset it by hand. Override. Yes, if you can find an alarm box, you can go it's reset it now. Right here. Oh, no, fuck you, fuck you. As long as that, uh-oh. Yeah, watch out. Um, but what was what was I saying? What was I saying before we got into what you're doing on screen? Um, oh, right, it, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. So like the voiceover you're hearing, that can change up um, in subtle ways based on which version of the cult you're dealing with. Um, that can, uh, uh, you know, there's also those notes and documents you were finding. Um, those can. Uh, definitely change depending on which version of the cult you're dealing with that time. Um, and then also the, uh, did you get it? Did you buy it? I bought oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's and so since you've close. already been captured twice, it's all over. So now we'll get to see how the restart works. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we change up the notes. We change up the, the voiceover you hear on the PA system. There's different scenes in the game that will up change. Um, and it's not, again, it's like there's there's always some dark elements to the cult where you would say, oh, that looks really bad, but maybe that's not as bad as another version of it that you might see. And as, as you play it, the game is designed, obviously, to be played multiple times. You see some of these differences and uh, has a shorter play time for that reason. I really hope that people play it like 
four or five times, I feel is a pretty good. If you get four or five endings, you've you've experienced um, a lot of what what is in there. Obviously, you can go on and try to be a completionist and collect even more endings. But um, so we change up those things. Those that friendly character you saw earlier, Charles, mm -hmm. like he'll say different things based on which version of the cult you're dealing with. Um, and obviously the cult leaders themselves will say different things when they capture you or when you try to confront them later in the game. Right on. Um, moving on down, uh, we can talk about, uh, this is kind of a solo dev project, right? It's you, the voice actors, um, and, I, and I assume you might have, must have had some contracted help, right? No, yeah, there were a bunch of people who worked on it, mm -hmm. um, primarily in art, because I don't do art, so all the mm -hmm. art you're seeing here was done by someone who was not me. Yeah. Um, but I did the design and the writing and, and uh, most of the gameplay programming. Yeah. I also had a couple of programmers doing like the console versions and load save system and stuff yeah. that was more technical. Um, but yeah, mostly mostly uh, I was the full-time guy on this for, for most of its development. Yeah, so let's talk about life as a solo developer because this is something our, our audience can relate to a lot because there's a lot of indie folks who write in. Um, uh, how was it sort of like, uh, how was your personal process for trying to um uh trying to wrangle um trying to wrangle your uh your design intentions and also being kind of the programmer who had to figure out and implement them right because it's one thing yeah. to sort of go oh here's a great idea for the if then clauses and then you go dive into your own <laughs> tools that you've made or you've borrowed or gotten uh from the from whatever tool store you're working with and then you're like oh no this is this is uh not what i intended yeah. No, I, I hadn't programmed. I programmed games early on uh, when I started in the industry. Um, and I sort of actually started with a project, a couple of projects very much like this, where I was the lead programmer, lead designer, and, mm -hmm. and leading the project. And then I went to work at bigger projects where I mostly focused on design, but still did programming here and there. And here getting back into doing programming was actually a lot of fun for me, just from a, it's like a muscle I hadn't been using for a while that I mm -hmm. enjoy. Um, you know, if I, I'm not someone who you want to have write your graphics engine or something like that. Or, but uh, I, I, I think I'm persistent enough at the gameplay stuff. Plus, there is a lot of advantage to being the designer where as well, where you can make those those trade offs, I think, as anyone who's done small projects. No, you don't have to spend as much time on documentation and meetings and stuff like that. So the, the communication is a lot more seamless. On the other hand, you know, it's I, I did miss, you know, some of the push and pull and variety of ideas you get, like collaborating with a programmer or something can can definitely make things better in a lot of ways. Uh, so I'm not discounting that or saying that's bad, but mm -hmm. uh, and, and we'd probably like to do that again in the future. Um, but for this one, it was just a, a very specific project that that was very personal to me and I wanted to get my hands fully dirty on. Um, so it was it was fun to do. It's definitely, I think. I guess going back to, you know, having more of a team that's a team that's full time there with you can mm -hmm. can really help with like keeping the project balanced and you know helping prioritize things. And of course, everyone's going to have their own opinions on that. But then you discuss it and kind of some sort of consensus, and that can be very valuable. Um, so you know there are advantages in terms of communication to a small team, and that you don't have to communicate as much because you're right there. But you know you don't get the variety of viewpoints and and stuff that can be really cool on a larger project. Right on. Um, uh, my next question, as I read this document, um, uh, is there anything you've sort of like you went into this project thinking uh, um, uh, this this kind of design was going to work one way, and then it wound up working another way? Do you have any examples of that you could point to? Yeah, the the biggest change probably from what I initially hoped for or thought of for the game was it was less about the friendly characters who you meet at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the early design, they didn't even exist. It was going to be purely the voiceover and the notes and documents you found. Um, and there was just enough people who were saying, I wish I could talk to some of the cult members um, that made me say, okay, we can add some cult members. They're still fully voiced, so that sort of limited how many we could do um, just in terms of, of budget and stuff. Um, but we got enough of them in there that I think it provides a little flavor of, of who you're meeting in the group. And we actually didn't add – the conversation system that's in there was added really late um, where before when you went and talked to them, they would just sort of talk at you for a while mm -hmm. and you weren't interacting with them. Um, because, you know, I'm not a huge fan of conversation trees. So they're just kind of like, 
you know, making me press a bunch of buttons to read all the stuff, you know, sometimes. But I maybe I I decided in the end after getting feedback from some people that, you know, having having them felt better than not having them. Like having some control over what what you're navigating in this conversation felt better than having none, even if it's sort of fake control, uh, if you know what I mean. So that was that was a pretty big change from what we originally planned. Yeah, uh, let's dig into that. Uh, um, you're on a you do a lot of great GDC panels about like sort of theoretical design, hypothetical design. Um, and tips for design. So what do you think about dialogue trees like? Because it's a very commonly used mechanic. Um, as a designer, what do you think is their sort of strength? Because you eventually chose to op- implement them, so there's some kind of strength. Right. Uh, what do you think are the strengths yeah. and weaknesses developers need to consider when design- when creating them? Yeah, I mean, I think they're fundamentally not as interesting as other mechanics that you can do. Because the dialogue trees are basically often... And you can do more complex things with them than this. So uh, I, I applaud those. But the most basic implementation is, you know, here's four options. Press one of each one and you'll eventually hear all this stuff, right? Um, and it's just – and it feels very canned. It doesn't feel like I can ask them anything, you know, which is kind of what I want to do. Like when you're wandering around this world right now as a player, you can go anywhere you want. You can go to this building. You can go to this. So there's just a ton of choices all the time about what you're doing. Uh, the conversation tree, we limit it down to like a pretty small number of choices. Mm-hmm. And – that's like less interesting to me fundamentally. But on the other hand, if you're having conversations with people, it's kind of the best thing we have right now. And I think it, you know, there are definitely conversation systems that have been done where that was more of a focus of the game, where they would have, you know, trust levels and like a wider swath of dialogue possibilities and and more of a simulation element uh, to the dialogue, and that can be great. Um, but was not something we had enough time. But that can be a very time-consuming thing to implement um, and not something we, we sort of had the time to do here. Um, so I think it's something to think about that. And I guess the takeaway I had why they ended up getting implemented was it just felt better than not having them. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it is winnowing the choices down to this very small thing at that time and it doesn't feel as robust as the rest of the gameplay in terms of you know choices per second that the player is making. Mm-hmm. Um it's still choices and people still like them. So, you know, sometimes you do the thing people like, even if it's not like your best possible version of a feature. I like uh, choices per second as a phrase because uh, um, it just fe- it just feels like a speed. Like how many choices per second is the player making? Uh, oh, no. There's yeah, no. And I, we I have to limit that. the choices per second. <laughs> I've, I've used that to talk about. You know, uh, games that have really long cutscenes. Like, there's zero choices per second going on during a cutscene, often, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and that's, you know, makes you not want to replay it as much because you're kind of watching the same thing or the same, you know, you're just not doing that much when you replay. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something we did in a patch, actually, that is coming out for the PlayStation version later this week, but isn't up there yet. So, you're not seeing it in the in the Steam version and soon in the PlayStation version and the other console versions, you can skip the dialogue on replays. So mm-hmm. you might come up to Teresa on another replay. She's saying slightly different things, but maybe you just want to read the subtitle and go through it faster because you've yeah. done this before. You now can do that in, in the newer with the patch. So uh, that's an example of, of uh, we implemented it, but we didn't implement the ability to skip. It was on the wish list, and then a lot of people asked for it after we shipped. So the option to skip is an interaction per second in a way as well. Yeah, no. Um, I think <laughs> I think about that with games. Um, God, what was I just playing? Oh, yeah, Fire Emblem. I'm playing Fire Emblem Three Houses, and the uh-huh. the choice to skip or not skip or, like, let like what am I observing? What is this part? Of, like, am I getting anything by watching this full animated scene versus blazing through the conversation, getting the points, the finer points? Um, uh, um that's definitely something I've been thinking about with other games. There's another developer, Horizon Zero Dawn. I was talking with um, I was talking with the guys from uh, who uh, Heaven's Vault, not Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate is a cult. Heaven's Vault is a game. I was talking with them about my experience playing Horizon Zero Dawn, and after revisiting the game and coming back for the DLC, I realized the the dialogue was just so much like it was good. It was really good dialogue, but I was like, I want to get back to hunting, jumping, climbing. Um, right. And skipping through it helped me get through it fast. So the design implications are certainly, they're subtle, if not, um, they're kind of quality of life, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's, it's, 
it's it's that trick where if yeah if once you have a part of the game that you really like and then it shifts gears into what feels like you're just in another game mm-hmm. you run that peril of of either they want to get back to the first game or the new game you've put them in is the one they want to stick with and then when that ends you're like oh but i like that other thing yeah and it is a, a sweet there's a sweet science to figuring out you know how to uh how to balance um how to balance those things so it doesn't feel like you know two games grafted together or something right on uh we're coming up at our 30 minute mark we are i should have mentioned a lot sooner we're happy to take questions from folks who are watching if there's anyone out there feel free to give us a shout um uh richard um uh making games is hard selling games is hard um uh uh that should be i said it like it's somehow profound but it's <laughs> blindingly obvious i think to everyone who spends time in games um how have you felt about communicating this game's existence to the world um and how have you felt what do you think is done right what do you think you've you've could have done done differently um i'm curious to know what your thoughts are about this because this is a cool little game and it's definitely just doing something different than what a lot of other games are doing out there but that's a lot of games yeah the i mean there's definitely a few things that uh you know, it's what uh, it's among the like. Well, we knew about this, but we didn't have time to get to it. That have mm-hmm. that have come up, like the skipping dialogue thing, like that was on a, on a wish list, but we hadn't done. And then enough people asked for it, just like great, let's do that. Um, and I think that's always the case that you've got your list of things and things that I thought were like, oh, this is the first thing I should patch, where totally nobody complains about it at all. So I'm, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're not doing it. Um, you know, definitely something we're focusing on is getting people's replays of the game to be more different every time to guarantee Mm -hmm. that um and sort of the random miss say for example in the the dialogue that plays over the pa system Mm -hmm. um right now it is random within the game you're playing but if you start a new game it's only random within that game so if you played a game and died within five minutes and start a new game there's a chance you might hear the same dialogue again pretty quickly and that sucks (laughs) sucks <laughs> so uh we've implemented a system where that won't happen anymore that's a patch uh i i'm is sort of in testing right now and hoping to get out later this week yeah um that's one thing you know it's definitely some stuff where i was so close to the controls on the game that they felt they i mean i i sort of knew the controls weren't as good as i wanted and that, again that was a thing on the feature list but um it was you know not it's the person's first time experience with it is not what I, I hoped often with some of the control things, particularly firing the gun uh, is something that I think needs some work. So we've got that on the, on the to-do list for a future patch as well. Yeah. Um, so some control stuff, some of the repetitive stuff, um, and then maybe just, you know, we're looking at ways to like vary up some of the gameplay on repeat plays too. So it's a little bit more different than it is right now. Mm-hmm. Right on. Uh, I think um, uh, I, I appreciate the way you're talking about. You know, like uh, sometimes you you just gotta um, you just gotta time to say go. Like uh, you gotta cut. <laughs> you cut can't, bait. can't work on it forever. Yeah, cut bait and run. What was your thought process? Like this is kind of a producer brain question. Is what is your thought process for um, this music's very nice by the way. Um, what is your thought Thank process you. for? making sure you're not bogged down in those like on your that magical list and versus being able to look at something and say this is great we will work on it after launch but it's time to go or after a milestone or something yeah i mean that's the million dollar question right is how when is it done enough and uh i don't know that i have (laughs) the perfect answer for that i think you know when you have a bigger like the perfect answer for that at a bigger company that has money to spend on things like that is like doing a lot of usability testing and and doing it with people who can actually play the game for an extended amount of time because mm-hmm. um, like some of the repetitiveness stuff is not something that people complained about before we launched because most people who played it would play it for a couple hours mm-hmm. and you don't really notice it it's when you get to the like you know the sixth or seventh hour or something you're like hey why am i hearing this again um and it's we have plenty of voiceover that you shouldn't be feeling that way um but it's just making sure it happens so like in a larger company that had budget for people to play it for 10 hours each or something um that stuff would have come up and we could have addressed it but here we were you know having smaller resources we did have people playing it but just not for that long period of time um and that's just something you know next time i would definitely figure out how to make sure that happens before shipping just to catch some of those easy fixes um that you can do to make things a lot better 
Right on. Uh, let's talk about replayability. We we brought it up as a game mm -hmm. design question. Um, in theory, every game is replayable. You just pop it open on Steam and you play it again. Whether it's Shovel Knight, whether it's Knights of the Old Republic, whether it's uh, Prey 2, which I was recently replaying. Uh, um, they actually they, they did a they split up their player character into two different characters for to encourage that. Uh, what do you think lets people design for replayability? Richard, do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that's a that's a, a good question for sure. There's, you know, there's two types of replayability in this game in particular. There's like the narrative replayability, and there's the, um, um, you know, core gameplay replayability, right? And I think, um, you know, just having enough. I think I think you have to have enough variety to the mechanics and the sort of challenge types that you face um, that can lead to pretty good replayability and that I think is something, again, we're going to be working on in the future. Um, so there's like just having enough depth there and enough, you know, it's a combination of, of authored and random, you know, depending on the nature of your game. If your game is meant to be roguelike, you need to have enough variety to how it generates each time that, that you feel it. And that's, again, something we're working on. Um, you know, in terms of narrative, I feel like we probably do a better job at that other than those easy wins that I was just talking about in terms of dialogue repeating when it shouldn't and stuff. Um, things that are almost bugs. Uh, they're so annoying. But, um, you know, in terms of replayability, I think you have to have, when you're looking at a narrative, um, you know, I like to say that in a lot of games that want you to replay for the narrative, where because you can make choices, get different endings, often you're playing, you know, it's, it's less common for games to have a story that changes every time as we do. And so often you'll play the game once the way you want to play it, make the you know narrative choices you want to make, and then the second time you'll basically play the game how you don't want to play it, and you'll be, oh, you got captured again. Yep. Uh, and you'll you'll make the opposite of the choices you made before, which is kind of not as fun, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but you want to see the content, so you do that. Um, here we're actually changing the reason for you to make the choices, so you'll mm -hmm. actually see the different content because the world has changed. Um, and people have, have complimented the game for that. Um, for that type of replayability. And I think having, you know, another thing that, you know, how the game presents narrative is not as, um, how to say, it's not in a conventional way as much. Like, you get little scenes like that one you just saw with Isaac capturing you, and that's not, you've, you've been captured by an antagonist in a video game before, and he talks to you, and then you get a chance to break out. Um, and it's not like, Oh my God, how is this narrative? That's a very conventional, almost like a cutscene. Um, but a lot of the way that the narrative is told in this game is just through the environmental storytelling and being in the world with these these people living their lives and hearing the PA and finding those documents and this things. This is what happens to me a lot when I get captured. Yeah. <laughs> you, Screw up you're not case. super good at breaking out, sir. Nope. Uh, the key is, let me tell you, the key here is to break out when he's not looking. And now I'll tell you, this is the hardest one to break out of. Yep. So we're um, restarting the whole thing so again very soon. I'll give, you, I'll give you some tips. We'll see if we can walk you through it. No, nah, that's fine. I can fine. we got to talk about the, ga the game is nice. but <laughs> the, only way to make uh, the key here is to, you really have to time it right. So once the guard comes up to talk to you or look mm -hmm. at you, he'll turn his back, and that's the time to break out. And then you got to run up and get him right away from behind. Just gonna keep spinning, um, spinning, spinning. Yeah, don't do that. That's that's not gonna. <laughs> it's not gonna get. It's just gonna wear out your cardio, man. Yeah. There's no cardio in the game. You you were very close to putting a cardio system in, weren't you? <laughs> it was brought up a couple times, mm -hmm. and someone whose feedback I trusted was like, "Nobody likes a sprint meter. Nobody. They, so you just put it into annoy players." So I was like, eh, "Yeah, I kind of agree." There's a, there is a version of this game that has a sprint meter that that is okay uh, too. So. It's just a choice we made not to do that. Um, What's well, let's talk meters. Um, yeah, meters are weird. Um, I probably should have killed that guy. Um, whatever. I'm gonna put him in the cage. Um, there you go. Uh, uh, meters are. What are the tools that you reach for as a designer when you're trying to create a like? This is such a game that speaks to like. This is something that real people have done. If you go watch, um, there's two great. Uh, um, you can either listen to like some of the. There are great podcasts like last podcast on the left. It's one of my favorites. There's a um. Uh, there's a drunk history episode about uh, the children of heaven, um, which it, uh, children of God, not children of heaven. I'm getting all these cults are mixed up in my head. Um, 
uh, Children of God is a good one. Like, real people have done this. How do you think about simulating, like, real, realistic sensations and experiences in games like this? How do you, how do you, like, the sprint meter represents mm-hmm. you get tired when you're running, but yeah. you know, sprint meters are there to annoy players. You just said so. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like a health bar is also an unrealistic thing, but we've got one of those, right? I mean, yeah. it's realist. It's an approximation of a real life event, right? Like a sprint yeah. meter is like, like that's not exactly how cardio works, but it's close enough that it feels like it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just one of the ones we decided not to do. And it's interesting that, the game definitely has gamey systems to it, like those sight cones you're seeing and the, the, um, you know, the the health bar. And some people really don't like that. Um, I've seen like people say, "Well, why can't the people see me in this case, and why can't they do this other thing?" And I'm like, "Well, at the end of the day, you know, we made choices about, you know, how realistic the game was going to be. Like, I think narratively, it feels pretty realistic to me. Like, this is really how you would." go about going into a cult versus if the game was a shooter or something, right? You would just murder everyone in the cult and then you'd find your ally, find your nephew at the end, right? But here that's impossible because in the real world that's also impossible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, here if you get into a gunfight with three people, you're in real trouble. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, in a shooter that would be something that happened every minute. So um, you incentivize. Right, right. So here it's like we have meters and things that are a little gamey and that it's why can't the guy see me past this point? Well, he can't. And some people can't get over and accept like some people would accept that in a game that was more um, like a cartoony setting or just a fantasy setting or something like that. But in a game that's otherwise realistic, that feels dissonant to them. To me, it doesn't. And to some people, it certainly doesn't. So uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting reaction that I didn't expect to get quite as much as we did. Interesting. Oh, no. Tender run, tender run, tender run. That's a body. You found a body, but I destroyed the alarm box. Hopefully that works out okay. Yeah. So, so you, that's only each alarm box. So, so no one can set off that alarm box now, but yeah. if they find another one, they can they still set They find another alarm. Why would they have more than one alarm box, Richard? <laughs> yeah, right. People don't have more than one alarm system in their house. Yes. <laughs> it's also a game like the way the alarm box is. is also a little yeah. gamey. Um, yeah. And it's certainly like there's... You know, I think for me, there's like a limit to how many vectors you can innovate on for sure. Mm -hmm. And here we were putting it more in the trying to make the narrative replayable stuff. Whereas a lot of the core gameplay here is like, oh, I kind of remember this from Metal Gear or I kind of remember this from Castle Wolfenstein, the very original Castle Wolfenstein. That was Mm -hmm. a game I liked a lot a billion years ago Um, and still like, but... You know, it was just a choice to, like, not innovate in that space. But we could have. We could have said, well, we're trying to make the whole thing realistic. So how would, like, a really interesting health model work here? And, and what could we do with that? And, again, that would just been, well, we're going to spend time on that instead of spending time on making more narrative choices or something. So mm-hmm. um, usually we bias towards the narrative stuff when we when we came to those, those forks. Right on. Um, as I continue to migrate this world... Um, Richard, let's talk about more fun game design things, I think. Uh, uh, let's talk about morality as a game design tool. Um, mm-hmm. We're all familiar with, I am a big fan of KOTOR, we're all a fan of light side and dark side bars. Um, uh, in this game, I have the option to, I was just mulling over the kill, don't kill of, uh, of what I was just dealing with. Um, uh, this, you can, I tend to play games like this less killy, I'm kind of of the opinion if a game, if a game gives me the option to not kill, I am bound for the most part to to do it uh, i don't know quite why it's not like a super great moral code i love shooting things in other games if the game is only shooting and killing um i'm all about that uh see my apex legends obsession um but uh how is you as a game designer as your players have sort of it's definitely made clear over the years they want interesting games they want interesting systems they want to make tough moral choices what's your thought for designing them this is there's like kind of a narrative component here but i wouldn't mind holding off on narrative for a minute because it has to do with character and relationships and stuff and just talking about like systems and bars and meters and punishment etc yeah well to me you know the i see the morality system is just hopelessly intertwined between narrative and gameplay both and you can't really not talk about them both at the same time to me the way i think about it um and you know it's often like you know, s- other games that are lovely but are different than this one will have like a, you know, there's like a more of a wrist slap for every bad thing you do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we definitely have, we definitely try to balance that here. Like, if you get captured, uh, 
you know, if you get shot, you get captured, and then you can break out and keep playing, unless you have murdered a lot of people, in which case they just kill you right away. And that's a neg- That's a wrist slap for, like, a gameplay negative for having made that choice, but it also makes a lot of sense, right, that they wouldn't take a chance on you if you had not uh, done that. Whereas there are other... You know, there's a there's like if you do non lethal takedowns, people get back up again in this game. Yeah, um, which, which is, is more. Like, yeah, it's, which it's, is. Go ahead. That's an interesting one because, like, for me, that system always frustrates me. But you're right; it's very realistic. Like when Metal Gear does it, I was like, "Oh, I guess this is realistic." Right, and certainly there's other like Dishonored. I like a lot, but I believe in that game. If you do a knockout on someone, they're out for the rest of the level, basically. Yeah. And again, that was just a case for me of. Well, a, how does it, so knocking someone out actually work? You know, if you put a sleeper hold on someone, they're not asleep for that long. <laughs> usually, they, they usually wake up pretty quickly, like within a minute. Um, it like doesn't put them into a blissful night slumber, right? It's it's mm-hmm. it's a different part of their brain. Um, but so it made sense that they would get up again, and I just wanted again to have a benefit almost to taking the negative route there where if you do you know actually break their neck when you take them down they're not going to get back up again and that might encourage you to break their neck because you know often there is which is a raw mechanical benefit to doing terrible things but you're doing terrible things so then that makes it almost more of an interesting choice like if the choice is like things always go badly if i make negative choices then i guess i won't make negative choices it has to be balanced of like there are some negative consequences to doing good things, and there's some positive consequences to doing good things. And it's sort of tricky to decide. You know, you have to decide as a player what you're willing to put up with and how important, like, getting an ending where you haven't killed anyone is. Yeah. Uh, in this game, I will assure viewers it is quite difficult. Uh, <laughs> and that's another interesting thing is how... how uh, the range of how difficult people find this game continues to fascinate me because some people will like this game's too easy. And, and that's, that's always, that's always the case that some people find it easy and some people find it too hard. But I think it's worse in this game for, because of the nature of stealth mechanics, maybe. Um, and just like learning how the, if you figure out how the systems work really well, it becomes a lot easier. And if you just struggle with them, it stays hard, you yeah. know? So there's a little bit more of a hump there than I wish there was. Um, so that may be something we look at in the future as well in terms of like slightly better tutorial for that stuff. Yep. Richard, we're coming up towards the end of our hour here. We've only got a little bit of time left with you. Um, uh, I guess I'll just start off by asking, uh, what, what's next for you as a game designer? You've, you've got a nice, you know, story, you know, you've done some really cool games with companies. You've struck out on your own as an independent designer. You've shipped a game that was kind of a passion project. What do you think is next for you on the horizon? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, that I do not have, uh, um, a perfect answer to. I'm sort of right now focused on these things that I wish were in this game that aren't yet. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got packs coming up and the panel we're doing there and um, things sort of leading up after that. And I, as, as I said, I see benefits to working on a large team that I really liked and missed. And, you know, working in your office by yourself can be really isolating in a lot of ways, but can also be really rewarding because it's more your personal thing. Um, so I see pluses and minuses and, you know, I can't say for sure which I'll do next. It sort of depends, um, what opportunities pop up, but I'm definitely starting to think about that while right now, just wishing I had finished this patch already. So, yeah. And for those at home, we're just, uh, just going to alluded to a couple times. We are playing the PS4 version of the game, which is mostly just a, uh, um, that was my own request because, uh, it's how we can basically make the stream happen as we play these games on console. Um, yeah. uh, the game is also on on some other systems, yeah. Xbox, Switch, and uh, and PC, and Mac. Yeah. How do you feel about the Switch? We've been asking a lot of devs about it. I mean, it's it's sort of, it's been a couple years now, so it's not quite as hot new, but uh, how do you feel about making games for the Switch? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a delightful device. I mean, my favorite thing about developing for the Switch is I can go play my game on the couch like literally play because it which is the same thing that attracts a lot of people to it's still like a full featured modern console experience if a little less powerful than the other ones but you know when it's time to go pl- do a playthrough there i can leave my desk and go relax somewhere while testing something mm-hmm. um so that's fun for de- as a developer um you know it's a it's a different system so it's like i'm definitely glad nintendo didn't just make 
you know, a, a system that was exactly like their competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's always good for the industry, and Nintendo's probably the most visionary at that, and they don't always hit it, but when they hit it, they hit it well, usually. So it's cool, you know, I definitely wish it was slightly more powerful, but uh, uh, but it's cool. Right, right on. Um, we are, uh, I'm sort of running out of questions, which was unfortunately just kind of a nature of what happens when you play the game by yourself. Um, so Richard, I'm going to take us out a little early, if you don't mind. That's just fine. Yeah. Uh, Richard, if they've got questions for you about making games or about the great GDC talks uh, that your pan panels you've been a part of, where should they ask them? Yeah. So uh, I'm on Twitter at Richard Rouse III, uh, and you can come find me there. Uh, I try to respond to as many people as possible, though it doesn't always happen, so you can always hit me back. Um, usually not in my DMs unless I already know you, but... Um, uh, sometimes the question's better there. That's fine, too. Uh, you can also, you know, the game has a website at paranoidproductions.com slash church. we got a mailing list there. Uh, there's also a Discord uh, run by the game's publisher. The game is published by Fellow Traveler, a lovely publisher of a variety of narrative indie games. Um, they have a Discord that you can find on their website. So if you go to Fellow Traveler dot games uh, is their url up on there there's a community button and that'll take you to the discord and i try to get in there and answer i'm not on there constantly definitely had some really fun chats with fans and other developers on there so come by there if you've got questions that's a good place for it um probably slightly better than twitter but twitter's good too and uh you know those are the main places or you know come come to a talk at gdc or or just come up to me in the hall at gdc if you happen to see me Right on. Uh, with that, I'm going to take us out. Uh, if you're new to this channel, we'd appreciate it if you toss the follow our way. Um, and if you are uh, not new to this channel, uh, you know, you can join us at XRDC later this year if you're interested in VR content. Or if you are VR, AR, and beyond. Uh, or if you're a game developer, please join us at Game Developers Conference next year in March. Uh, with that, right. have a good day, everyone. I'm Bye. glad you got to the pigs right at the end. Yeah, I found my the favorite pigs. things in the game. They're yeah. very important. Love the pigs. Pigs are very important. Bye, everybody.